All right, so today we are going deep on bamboo. Oh, very cool. And its potential for helping to fight climate change. Yeah. You've sent us a whole bunch of project documents from all these bamboo reforestation projects. Yes. Mainly, it seems to be focusing on this huge initiative in Uganda, mm -hmm. but there's also some stuff from Ghana, South Africa, and the Philippines, too. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be really picking up steam. So we're going to be looking at all that and uh, unpacking it and seeing what it means for you and the planet and all the challenges and opportunities. and Exactly, yeah. I mean, what's really interesting to me looking at these projects is how they're kind of leveraging bamboo's rapid growth and its ability to really absorb carbon. Yeah. It's more than just like planting trees, right? It's yeah. tapping into bamboo's unique qualities to make a real tangible difference. Okay, let's start with this Uganda project. Right. This one MTN Uganda bamboo planting project. Okay. They're aiming to plant bamboo across degraded lands in the entire country. Wow. And it's projected to remove millions of tons of CO2e over 30 years. Yeah, that's that's massive. Yeah, that's a serious chunk of carbon. It is. And you know what's really cool is that it's not just like a pie in the sky estimate. This project mm -hmm. is aligned with the verified carbon standard, oh, okay. which means it has to meet some super strict requirements for carbon offsetting. Right. So it's not just like, oh, yeah, we're planting these trees. It's fine. It's like, no, this is actually verifiable. Yeah. It's quantifiable. It has a real impact. So it's not just like greenwashing. Exactly. It's they're aiming to actually have a measurable impact on carbon emissions. Absolutely. Which is a big deal for companies that are looking to offset their you know, footprint. Huge. I mean, that's a big draw. Okay, so what makes the Uganda project stand out from all the other bamboo projects that are popping up? Right. Well, it's interesting because it kind of tackles several issues at once. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just focused on carbon sequestration. Okay. They're also like focusing on degraded lands with low biomass. So they're not like disrupting existing ecosystems, right. which can be a big concern with these large scale planting efforts. Yeah, that makes sense to kind of focus on areas that are already struggling rather than exactly. potentially harming healthy ecosystems. Yeah. And, you know, a big question with any project like this is how does it affect the people? Yeah. Yeah. The communities in those areas. Exactly. So in this case, that's where the 1MTN Foundation comes in. Okay. So this NGO is going to be representing local communities and ensuring they get a share of the profits from the project. Okay. And They'll also have access to the plantations for, you know, firewood. Okay. Which will kind of ease the pressure on natural forests. So they're kind of creating a system where local communities are active participants. Yeah. And beneficiaries, not just bystanders. Yeah. They're woven into the fabric of the project. That's a huge part of, like, sustainable development, right? It can't just be, like, this outside force coming in and saying, exactly. we're going to plant all this stuff. And you have no say. <laughs> yeah. And, and what about the financial side of it? Yeah. So that's another really cool aspect. This project is designed to generate carbon credits, okay, which can then be sold to companies, you know, the ones who are trying to offset their emissions. Right, right. Yeah. And that creates a financial incentive yeah. for reforestation. So it's a win-win for like the environment and the local communities. So we've got carbon reduction, environmental restoration, community benefits, and economic opportunities all rolled into one. All in one. Yeah, it I, sounds almost too good to be true. Right. And that's where, you know, you start to think, okay, what are the potential challenges? Yeah, they're downsides. Like, what are we not seeing? And I think looking at the documents from the other projects in Ghana and South Africa and the Philippines, yeah. those give us some clues. Okay, so let's talk about those challenges. Right. What are some of the hurdles these projects face? And, and are they addressed in the Uganda project plan? One thing that jumps out is the reliance on carbon finance. Oh. Like, it's a great way to get funding. Oh. But the market for carbon credits, it can be really volatile. Okay. So yeah. you have this uncertainty, which makes it hard to plan long term. So even if the project's well designed, mm -hmm. if you're relying on this single funding source, yeah. that could potentially be shaky. Exactly. That's a good point. What are some other things we should be aware of? Well, let's see. Um... Okay, so we were talking about some of the challenges these bamboo projects are facing. Yeah, it's not always easy. Not all smooth sailing. No, not at all. And we were talking about carbon finance. Right, right. Which can be unstable. Yeah, the volatility. Yeah, and that's really just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the documents from Ghana, South Africa, and the Philippines, they really highlight how complicated it is to make these projects work. Okay, so let's talk about those complexities. Okay. What are some of the recurring challenges, and how do these projects try to address them? Well, a big one is the way people see 
bamboo, the perception of it. Okay. In a lot of places, it's seen as like the poor man's timber, you know, like something you use if you can't afford anything better. Right. And this really underestimates bamboo's true potential. And it makes it harder to develop a thriving industry around it. Yeah. I mean, we see a lot of like innovative uses for bamboo these days, like in construction and even clothing. Right. But that perception might be holding it back in other areas. Exactly. So these projects are really focusing on showing how versatile bamboo is, you know, its true value. Right. Like the Ghana project, they've managed to get Forest Stewardship Council certification. Okay. What does that mean? So it's the FSC. And it basically means they're managing the forest in a really responsible way. Okay. Environmentally sound, socially beneficial, and economically viable. So it's not just like a, a feel-good label. No, it's a real signal to consumers that the bamboo products they're buying right. are coming from a sustainable source. That's a big deal for like conscious consumers. It is, and it's a big step towards changing those perceptions we were talking about. Okay, cool. So what about the South Africa project? All right, so... The Eastern Cape Bamboo Forestry Project. Okay. They're dealing with a really tough one. Oh, no. What's that? Extreme drought. Okay. That's a huge hurdle for any kind of reforestation, especially with a plant that's known to need a lot of water. Right. But they're adapting. How so? Well, they're focusing on resilient species that can handle those dry spells, you know, long periods without rain. It's amazing how adaptable bamboo is. Yeah, there's a bamboo species out there for almost every challenge, it seems like. So it's not just about the environment, right? Yeah. There's like a human side to all this. Absolutely, a social element, yeah. And are these projects taking that into account? Oh yeah, very much so. Like the South Africa project, they're very focused on creating jobs, secure income for local communities. Okay, just like in Uganda. Exactly, it's about weaving bamboo into people's lives and livelihoods. Making it sustainable on all these different levels. Right, and the Philippines project, they take it even further. They're actually working in a conflict-affected region. Oh, wow, so there's a peace-building component to it. Exactly, yeah. They're working really closely with communities and government agencies to make sure that the project actually contributes to stability and reconciliation. So they're using bamboo as a way to bring people together. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. That's incredible. It's like the power of nature to heal. Right. But they also have this other challenge. They're facing this invasive grass. Oh, right. I remember that. It's called Kogon grass. Mm. And it's really invasive. And it can choke out other plants, even bamboo. So they're fighting like a war on two fronts. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. The conflict and then this invasive species. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing that comes up a lot in these documents. Okay, what's that? Land tenure. Uh, remind me what that is. Oh, it's basically about who has the right to use and manage the land. Right, right. It can get pretty complex, but it's a big deal for these projects. Okay, how so? Well, you know, if you're creating these big plantations, even with good intentions, it could end up displacing people or causing conflict over land ownership. So it's something that needs careful planning. Yeah, it's not as simple as just coming in and saying, we're going to plant a bunch of trees here. Exactly. You need to make sure that the local communities are on board. Yeah, have a say in how things are done. Right, free prior and informed consent, that's crucial. Otherwise, even a project that's meant to do good could backfire. Absolutely. So it's not just about the ecological side of bamboo reforestation, but also about these social and economic dynamics. Yeah, it's a good reminder that sustainability is about people too, not just the environment. Exactly. And that brings us to another challenge that people sometimes overlook. Okay, I'm ready. Hit me. Monoculture. Monoculture, you mean like only planting one type of bamboo? Exactly. And even though bamboo is really diverse, right. if you only plant one species in a certain area, it can make the whole ecosystem more vulnerable. Okay. How so? Well, it's like putting all your eggs in one basket. Right. If a pest or disease comes along that specifically targets that one species. Right. It could wipe out the whole thing. Exactly. So you need a diverse planting strategy. Okay. And good biosecurity measures. So you're not just promoting bamboo, but also protecting the biodiversity of the whole ecosystem. Exactly. It's all about balance. Okay. So we've looked at all these benefits and potential problems. Yeah. Where do you stand now on bamboo reforestation as a solution? You know, I'm cautiously optimistic. Okay. I think bamboo has a lot to offer. It grows fast. It absorbs carbon. It's got all these uses. Right. But it's not a magic bullet. We need to be smart about it and make sure these projects are done right. Right both for people and the planet. Exactly. And now we're getting to the next part of our deep dive. Okay. 
We've talked about the big picture, but what about actually putting these plans into action? Yeah, let's get into the nitty gritty. All right, what does it actually take to plant, manage, and harvest bamboo in a sustainable way? Yeah, let's get practical. Well, these project documents actually have a lot of detail about that. Okay, let's roll up our sleeves. Metaphorically, of course. Of course. And dive into the practical side of bamboo reforestation. All right, so we're back for the final part of our bamboo deep dive. Yeah, time to get into the details. Yeah, we talked about the potential and the challenges. Right, all the big ideas. And now it's time to get our hands dirty, metaphorically speaking. Of course. Of and so. actually see how these bamboo forests, like, take shape. Yeah, it's one thing to make plans, but actually getting those bamboo plants in the ground yeah. and making sure they thrive, that's a whole other story. Okay, so... Where do you even begin with a project like this? Well, it starts with picking the right spot. Okay. The Uganda project documents, they really go into depth about their site selection process. Right. They're not just planting bamboo anywhere. So it's not as simple as just finding some empty land and throwing down some seeds? No, no, not at all. What do they do? They're using all these high-tech tools like GIS, that's Geographic Information Systems, okay. to figure out like which areas have the best soil, the right conditions, Okay. And also to make sure they're not messing with existing ecosystems. So technology is playing a big role here. Oh, yeah, from the very beginning. Interesting. So it's not just about, like, shovels and manpower. No, they're using these GIS tools to map out the whole planting design. Wow. Like how far apart the plants should be, which direction the rows should go. To maximize their growth. Exactly. Get the most sunlight. That's pretty cool. Yeah, a lot of planning goes into this. Before they even plant anything. Exactly. Okay, so once they found the perfect spot. Right, then comes the land prep. Okay. You know, clearing out vegetation, maybe tilling the soil, sometimes even adding fertilizer. So it's pretty labor intensive. Yeah, it can be. But that's actually seen as a good thing by a lot of these projects. Okay, how so? Well, it creates jobs. Ah, right for the local community. Exactly. So right from the start, there's this economic benefit along with the environmental stuff. I like that. It's like a win-win from the get-go. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now you've got the land prepped. Right. How do you actually get those bamboo plants going? So the most common way is to plant seedlings. Seedlings? Yeah, like baby bamboo plants. Okay. That have been grown in a nursery. Oh, okay. So kind of like when you start a vegetable garden with like starter plants. Exactly. But there's this other method that's becoming more popular. It's called planting rhizome cuttings. Rhizome cuttings. I'm not familiar with that. So a rhizome is basically the underground stem of a bamboo plant. Okay. And they're like clones of the parent plant. Interesting. So you can take a piece of rhizome, plant it, and it'll grow into a new bamboo clump. So it's kind of like a shortcut? Yeah, you don't have to wait for the seedling to grow. Okay. And rhizome cuttings are often tougher than seedlings. Oh, that's good. Yeah, especially in those harsh environments we were talking about. So once you've got the plants in the ground, whether it's seedlings or rhizomes, mm -hmm. is that it? Do you just sit back and let them grow? Well, not quite. What else do you have to do? Bamboo needs a bit of TLC, you know, to make sure it grows strong and healthy. Okay, what kind of, like, maintenance are we talking about here? Weeding is a big one. Weed? Yeah, bamboo grows fast, but when it's young, weeds can be a problem. Oh, I see. So you're giving the bamboo a head start. Exactly. Make sure those weeds aren't hogging all the resources. Right. And as the bamboo gets bigger, you need to do some thinning. Thinning? You mean like taking some of the bamboo out? Yeah, because as the bamboo clumps grow, they produce more and more culms, you know, those tall woody stems. Right. But not all culms are created equal. Some are stronger than others. So you're basically removing the weaker ones. Right, to give the strong ones more room to grow. Okay. Plus, thinning helps with air circulation, prevents pests and diseases. It's like you're creating the perfect bamboo spa. Yeah, something like that. Give those plants everything they need to thrive. Exactly, and all this management, it creates more jobs. Right, for the local folks. Yeah, so it's good for the environment and the economy. So eventually you have to harvest the bamboo, right? Yeah, but you gotta do it sustainably. Okay, what does that look like in practice? Well, you can't just go in and chop down everything. Right. You have to leave enough behind so the plant can keep growing. So it's kind of like pruning a tree. You take some, but not too much. Exactly. And you also have to think about the age of the combs you're harvesting. The age. How does that matter? So bamboo combs, they have a life cycle. They start young, then they mature, then they get old. Okay. You want to harvest them when they're at their peak before they start to weaken. So there's a sweet spot. Yeah, a perfect time to harvest. And that depends on the species. Right, and what you're going to use the bamboo for. So there's a science to it. 
Absolutely. These projects have all these detailed harvesting plans to make sure they're using the resource wisely. Okay, so we've talked about all these uses for bamboo. Yeah. Construction, clothes, fuel. Once you've harvested it, what happens to it? That's where it gets really exciting. There's this whole world of bamboo processing and manufacturing. Okay. And a lot of it's happening right in the communities where the bamboo is grown. Wow, so you're creating a whole new industry. Exactly. People are learning new skills like weaving, construction, even making bioplastics from bamboo. It's amazing what you can do with this plant. It really is. And I think that's what's so cool about bamboo reforestation. It's not just about planting trees. Right. It's about building a whole system that's good for people and the planet. Yeah, we've seen how these projects are tackling climate change, restoring land, creating jobs, even helping communities heal after conflicts. It's really inspiring. It is. And yeah, there are challenges, but bamboo has this incredible potential to create a better future. OK, so what's the one thing you want our listeners to remember from this deep dive? I want them to remember that bamboo is more than just a plant. It's a symbol of hope. Okay. It's a reminder that even with all the problems in the world, there are solutions out there. And those solutions can be both practical and inspiring. I love that. Well said. So on that note, we're going to wrap up this episode of The Deep Dive. Okay. Thanks for joining us on this journey into the world of bamboo reforestation. And until next time, keep exploring, keep learning. <laughs>